Good morning, Inver Hills Church. Merry Christmas. To, use, to those who are watching the live stream, welcome. I hope you're excited and encouraged. We are going to commune with the living God. Amen. <laughs> he's real. He's alive. He's active. He's in a really good mood. <laughs> The scriptures say, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The Father's heart is open this morning to us. So as we worship him, as we sing, as we praise him, something unique is going to happen. So I just want us to prepare our hearts and just call upon him. So if you just pray with me, Lord. Oh, Father. Thank you so much for the gift of your son. Thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for adopting us and bringing us into your family. We come, Lord, excited, knowing that we serve an awesome God who reigns on heaven and reigns on earth. And we call upon you and we cry out to you this morning, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. There is none like you. We even speak to our own souls, our own hearts, and say, oh soul, would you rise up and awaken and worship the living God. Lord, cause every part of us to come alive as we sing unto the creator of life himself. You are worthy of all glory and honor and power forever and ever and ever. And right now in heaven, there are creatures and elders casting their crowns before you and worshiping you. Lord, you are worthy and we join with the awesome universal church right now in all of heaven in worship of a God who can be compared to none other. What a privilege. What an honor. Jesus Christ, we worship you this morning with all our hearts. Amen. Let's stand and worship this morning. songs that we sing it's a reflection of our ever-changing lives the best we have to offer we don't just lift up our hands lord we lift up our lives for we know that you are worthy of our praise for you our life songs raise rescue from darkness we are walking marvelous life for we are children of the king sing you are worthy of all honor glory praise and power king of the nations you are holy that we sing the reflection of our ever-changing lives the best we have to offer we don't just lift up our hands lord we lift up our lives for we know that you are worthy of our praise to you our life song drinks rescued from darkness we are walking a marvel life for we are children of the king sing you are worthy of all honor glory praise and power king of the nations you are holy god almighty glory Yeah. Uh -huh. 
was like For we are children of the King Sing, sing You are worthy of all next song that we're going to be singing is Holy Spirit. It's talking about the presence of God. You know, in Exodus, Moses and God were having a conversation. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, you know what I'm talking about. God said, I'm, I'm gonna, you can go in the promised land. You can go into the place that I prepare for you with milk and honey, and I'm going to help you fight your enemies but I'm not going with you. I'm not going without you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. God said, I'm not going, Moses, with you. And Moses said, how are we going to be delin- How are we going to be different than any other people in the nation if your presence doesn't go with us? 400 years they had been living in bondage, in exile. And the promise was right there. And Moses said, I don't want the promise without your presence. People, we are people of the presence of God. We must value the presence of God above all else because if Moses wasn't willing to go into the promised land without the presence, We don't want church without the presence of God. That is what we are here for, to worship and honor the presence of God. So position your hearts. Holy Spirit, come. You are already here. Just have your way. We want your presence. We want your presence above anything else because everything flows from the presence of God. All healing, all security, all joy, everything is in your presence. There's nothing else that we desire. So God, break off right now. Anything that is distracting us from entering in to the presence of the Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Your 
so whom shall I fear? psalm it says you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies have you thought about that why would God prepare a table for you in the presence of the enemies he wants you to know you are surrounded by him he's got you and he's going to make your life a living letter, a spectacle for everyone to read and bring glory to God. Shit. Imagine the shepherds there, Meg. Tell me. They're pretty surrounded. First, one angel freaked them out. They were terrified. Then the sky is filled. <laughs> they filled with the army of God singing praises to the king. That's what's surrounding us today. That's what's surrounding you. So God, we just break off whatever it is, Lord, that's been hanging on. Lord, even just wash away the residue as we just embrace the fact we're surrounded, God, not only with you and your presence, but an angelic host, God, that are assigned <laughs> from the King of Heaven. That these are are heaven's army. So God, Lord, may we just sense your spirit today in that supernatural kind of way. Lord, in its heat, in its light, in its radiance, and its love. Surround us, I pray, in Jesus' name. It's a table you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. 
that your body will blood you shed for me. This is how I find my love. There's a table. There's a table you prepare for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and blood you shed for me, and this is how I find my battles. And I
Come on, declare church. My victories in Jesus name. I want to hear you. My victories in Jesus name. From the belly of your heart, come on. My victories in Jesus name. Victories in Jesus name. My 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 Tell your soul, wake up. My victories in Jesus name. 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 My victories in the third day. My victories in the third day. My victories in the third day. My victory rose from the grave. My victory rose from the grave. There's no other name in heaven and earth to be saved. It's you, Jesus. There's no other name than the name of Jesus. So we call upon. sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often fall. Trials 
Holy Spirit is my holiday spirit and my source of joy. Connection and celebration, no matter what my situation this Christmas. I will celebrate what I do have this season and not focus on what I don't have. My gifts to others will bring healing, wholeness, and restoration. I will bring the good news of Jesus that will bring great joy to all those who believe. And I proclaim the glory of God and declare his peace on earth. Amen. You may be seated. Praise Jesus. Well, I don't know about you, but I had a good time in worship. Amen. Thank you, Thomas and Prince and Kim and Pierre. And I think I'm the only one that doesn't have a name that kind of flows with that. So just, oh, yeah. Mr. Madden, thank you. Whew. Well, David Tillman in rally was talking about giving. And, uh, you know, that whole, I brought up and I read the Malachi 3 verse where, he, where God says, test me and know that I'm God. And it's all about tithe. But I challenge you to read what he says in response. And basically, he's going to open up heaven and pour it out upon you. 
And the testimonies, we used to give testimonies over the years. We'd have people come in and say what happened when they tithed. And uh, one of the young couples were in uh, Christ for the Nations. And uh, the founder's wife, the founder had long since died, and they were in a financial crisis, and his wife stood up. And the way they told it, it reminded me of, um, I went to Cho's church way back in 1983, and he was led to the Lord through the prayer, excuse me, through the prayer of his mother-in-law. So there's somebody that can't despise their mother-in-law right there. But she was given so much honor, you know that back piece is missing. Anyway, she was given so much honor that every Sunday there'd be some music playing, but she would get up from her seat on the platform and go to the pulpit and she would ring a bell. And when she rang a bell, everyone, 30,000, between 30 and 33,000, would stand up and praise God in the spirit. And it would go on for 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, it just gave you goosebumps. And then when she felt it was time and the presence was there and people were in unity, she'd go up and ring the bell again. And I, I just, I say that because it's like when you give, one of the things you align, okay, is your body and your soul with the spirit. You just align it. You come under God's provision and protection. And uh, I used to joke that Malachi was actually Malachi. You know, it was that Italian book in the Bible. And so you just give him your protection money. But it's so, so much more than that. It's so much more than that. And so I just challenge you because what David was saying as we go into the New Testament, you know, it's like, well, I'm a New Testament giver. Are you really? Because in, in, in the first century church, they would sell their land and give all the money to feed the sick and the poor. You know, the widow gave her might and it was everything. And Jesus, when he comes on the scene and says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he goes on to preach on the seven principles of the kingdom. And he says, the old covenant said this, but I'm up in the stakes. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't diminish it. He magnifies it. And he says, and that, he says if, when you give, you give so that your right hand doesn't even know what your left hand is given or vice versa. When you give, don't give as, or pray as the publicans in private, but in that prayer closet before the Father. So I just encourage you this year as we start a new year, just see what God wants you to do. You know, we used to always emphasize every year in our missions giving the faith promise. In fact, when I came here, there was a great big wooden thermometer with tin foil, you know, and half of it was painted red. And as people gave, they would roll that so that we would get, the thermometer would go up until we met our need. And it was just, what's happened with giving to missions over the years is more people have just kind of taken their own, you know, it's like, I'm going to support my own ministry. I'm going to do my own thing. But there's so much, I just think so much power when you bring it in together. And um, we have relationship with every missionary now that we support and um, planning trips. So just, I encourage you to, as the one associate pastor wrote in the bulletin one day, for this new year, I've upped my giving. Up yours. So God, we just thank you. <laughs> we thank you that we can never outgive you. We thank you that we invite you into our finances, into our management, into our stewardship when we partner with you by giving. And God, whether it's Warehouser who was giving over 40% when he retired, or J.C. Penney, who started at 10 and went to 100%, God, or all the other, you know, examples, God, of the partners in global transformation that decided they could not be the majority partner of their business, so they always gave over 51%. And, and God, you gave back to them 100, 200, 300 fold. Lord, it's not about what we receive. It's about literally the bondage that falls off when we put you in charge. And so we put you in charge now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Here's what's happening at Inver Hills Church. A reminder that there are no classes this Wednesday night. Classes resume January 5th as we continue with one final class of Keep Your Love On. Even if you have not regularly attended this class, there is so much to benefit from this last lesson. We focus on the importance of setting boundaries in relationships. We would love to see you there. 
Then, Wednesday, January 12th, we begin new classes for 2022. The men delve into the book of Hebrews, and the ladies explore stories and lessons from women of the Bible. All classes are open to everyone and require no registration. Everything starts at 6.30 p.m. Are you hungry to worship and praise together? Join us as we follow the Holy Spirit into an experience with His glory. You're invited to a night of song and prophetic worship on Friday, January 7th at 7 p.m. We can't think of a better way to begin a new year than being excited and expectant for greater things from God. This week's power verse is Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. All right, I think I'm wired for sound now. Am I there? Are we there yet? Well, one of the things that happened in my Christmas as a testimony in Deep Thoughts with Pastor Bart was I wasn't going to have, I mean, we had our family Christmas a few weeks ago, and so I was going into this holiday season without any Christmas Eve or Christmas Day plans. Oh, the violin player is supposed to be playing right there. <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, you know, I didn't really focus on it. But it was in the back of my mind, and, and I bought this meal for Christmas Eve, and I didn't even feel hungry when I came to the Christmas Eve service. And, and yet God just put somebody in my path that needed a place to be. And so it was so cool to go home and have a meal that I could throw on and just have this great time with somebody who needed to have Christmas Eve somewhere. And yesterday, I was just chilling with my you know, new best friend named Nikki. You know, a one-year, one-year-old English setter pup. But I was thanking God because I realized that more things were added to my Christmas this year than ever before. And I brought my phone up, and I'm still going to butcher names, but it's a new partnership, not only with Evangelist Anash, but with uh, Shazad Shadiki who is the founder and president of Praise Television. And I was able to, to give a Christmas message um, over Praise TV in uh, about 15 countries. And then this um, Peridi uh, Siddha. If you're watching, I apologize if I butchered your name. But I had this great opportunity this, also in this season then to, to, to teach for two hours um, several hundred pastors in India. And as I focused on that, I was walking around in here praying with the dog. <laughs> it's my new prayer dog. And um, when you, all you have to do is say paw, you know, and it'll put your paw up like this. And so I was just praying for you. Just, just remember that. But I was just thanking God for the fact we live in this era where <laughs> you can reach out all the way around the world. You can do it from your own living room. Um, I don't. I come here, <laughs> partially because I have a roommate in the basement. So, you know, my preaching times overseas is usually 10 to midnight or 6 in the morning. So I figured I wouldn't appreciate that. But I just thought I spent Christmas with thousands of people. I was able to share a message of Jesus, you know, to millions of people. And so I am so thankful and we're not going to leave the Christmas message. I left the wise men for today. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. We're going to go back into the Christmas message. Um, and does anybody have any idea why I left the wise men for after Christmas? Because they came after Christmas. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, during the reign of King Herod, Herod the Great, about the time some wise men from the east lands arrived in Jerusalem, 
where is this newborn king of the Jews? So they, they went to the king asking, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. As was everyone in Jerusalem, he called the meeting for his leading priests and teachers of religious law, and he says, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? He said, well, in Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come out of you who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, well, why don't you go to Bethlehem and search carefully for this child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went there, their own way, and, and they the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with the mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when the time was to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. God, I just thank you that you added, <laughs> you added so many components to Jesus' birthday. You started with the shepherds because you were sending the shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus. And Lord, you use scripture right to confirm it right in, in this very passage when you said and quoted the Old Testament prophet and said, who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel? God, you sent the archangel and then you covered the area of Bethlehem with your angelic army. Lord, when the shepherds saw Jesus, they couldn't help but be transformed and they went to everyone, thousands who had come to this village to be counted in the census that he's Jesus, he's the king. Lord, you brought these wise men from afar, these magi, these astrologists from other countries, from other religions, but this star, <laughs> this phenomenon, this supernatural astrological phenomenon was enough to make them leave their families, their jobs, everything they were doing, for three, maybe even four years, we don't know, to travel, to pay honor and homage to the King of the Jews. God, may it move our heart <laughs> to think of what we do for our King. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There, there's so much just in this passage alone, um, but you know, I... I I was hung up on the king, and it started with somebody who came to me, and I've told you the story a couple times already for Christmas, but it was like, he couldn't believe this crazy lady who came to him and said that the kings weren't there, you know, in the, in the stable, that these three kings, because, I mean, in the manger scene, they're there, you know? It's like, of course they were there. And I'm like, you know, I had to say, no, no, it was eh, anywhere from a year to two years later. Um, he's like, no way. It's like, well, yeah. If you read the story, and we'll get to that, there's a little more to this story. You see, after Herod figured out he'd been duped by these magi, he did something that was also predicted in the prophecies seven to 400 years before, and that is he sent his armies to the region of Judea to kill every Hebrew boy two years and younger. Because he wanted not to worship that king, but to eliminate that king. But let's start with Bethlehem, a small town about five miles south of Jerusalem. It sits on a high ridge about 2,000 feet above sea level. Matthew 1.17 says, there were 14 generations from David to the carrying away of Babylon, and, and there were 14 generations from the carrying away of Babylon in, uh, to the Messiah. Why is this significant? Because by law, all right, 
they had decreed that everyone for this census must go to the town, okay? In this case, if they're from the lineage of David, they had to go to Bethlehem. Well, that's 28 generations of people. So I looked and I'm like, a generation could be anything from over the course of time, it's been measured for as little as 28 years to 45 years. But in biblical times, it, it was, especially in the Old Testament, it was 35 years. A generation was 35 years. That would make 980 years worth of relatives showing up to party in one town. A lot of people in that little village. And that's significant because the shepherds ran around to everybody. Now, if the Magi from other countries, and we'll get to their origin and their, where they're from possibly in a second, but if they knew the prophecies, how much more all of the descendants of David who came to Bethlehem? So they already had a lot of these prophecies. Remember uh, several years ago, there's 365 prophecies of Jesus in the Bible. At this point, about 270 are fulfilled. Um, But the eight specifically about Jesus be born in Bethlehem, they they knew that. It was a part of their history. Not only was it a part of their history, it was what they put their hope in. They had spent so much of the last several generations oppressed and as slaves to other countries. And their hope was in the fact that God was sending the Messiah. And so that's Bethlehem. The significance of the story of the wise men is that they, they would, they weren't relatives necessarily. And yet they came from afar to give this Hebrew, this Messiah, this Emmanuel, praise. And they went to the king, Herod. Now, what's interesting is not long after the census, Herod dies. But before he does, he gives this decree where he says to go and to kill all Hebrew boys two years and younger. So the location was Bethlehem. The star, you know, it's interesting because we know because Herod made the decree to kill all Hebrew boys two years and younger, that somewhere between a year and two years, you know, it's not absolutely specific, but even the most maniacal person wouldn't kill two-year-old babies if they only needed to kill one-year-old babies. But to be safe, all Hebrew boys around Bethlehem were to be killed. Now, thank God Jesus wasn't killed. Why? Because just like an angel in the dream warned The Magi, now, by the very title, Magi, there's an indication that they're not Christian. There's a very good chance they might not even be Hebrew. And yet, how were they warned to go back a different way? By an angel in a dream. The phenomenon that's happening in Pakistan and Syria and Iran and Iraq and all over the Middle East, in Turkey, is that now millions of people that were not Hebrew (laughs) and were not Christian, were not Jewish, are having dreams and being spoken of to by angels and by Jesus himself. Millions are having divine encounters with God that are leading them to Christ. Doesn't surprise you? What I think is so cool is that's what was happening in the first century church. It was normal. Guess what? It's normal today. I think if it's not happening to us, we just need to increase our normal, our supernatural spiritual normal. So here's the star. And like I I said before, it has been determined now by scientists that they feel that that light can be explained by the alignment of Mars and Venus. But what can't be explained is the fact that however, a year, 15 months, 18 months later, the star (laughs) was appearing before the wise men still to guide them. Mars and Venus didn't decide to take a holiday and just line up and park, okay? 
in alignment with each other for two years. And if they did stop their normal rotations, all right, why didn't it disrupt, you know, our system? Because it's supernatural. Okay, Creator God did this. Why? Well, this, the more I study this story and the more I study the story of the wise men, the more I was reminded of Moses and Pharaoh and leaving Egypt. Even as a kid, I wrestled with the fact that there were 10 plagues. You know what I mean? It was like, hey, God, when is enough enough? And the reason I bring it up is what happened after every plague? Initially, Pharaoh would go, hey, take the people and get out of here. But then what would happen? God would harden his heart. And I was just like, you know, at some point, this is, seems like a cruel game. You know? It's like he hardens the heart of Pharaoh on purpose to bring another plague, to bring another plague. And the last one, my goodness, it was kill the firstborn of every family unless they had the blood of a lamb over their doorpost. Well, what's the, how do these two stories align? Well, there was so much supernatural in the story of delivering the children of Israel from Egypt, uh, going to the Red Sea, and, and the people just crying out and going, oh, sure, you, you know, all this happened to get us here just so we could, be, we could be slaughtered at the edge of the sea, and the sea opens, and they go across on dry land, and then Pharaoh and his army and all of their chariots are destroyed this God brings the water back. Now, what was the significance of all of that? Forty years later, when they crossed the Jordan River and they're starting to approach the first major city of Jericho with walls 11 feet thick, everyone in the city of Jericho was petrified because they had heard of the stories of the supernatural occurrences of the God of the Israelites. Here we are, thousands of years later at Bethlehem. You know, the, 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 the centerpiece of the story. And you have all of these supernatural signs. God, once again, wanting to make sure that nobody could make a mistake, that this was his hand involved. This was what he did. So here is this star. In Matthew, the passage, the wise men say they had seen a star as it rose. But then we just got through reading, all right, that the star appeared unto them again after they met with Herod, and they were filled with joy, and they followed it to the entrance of the house. Now, <laughs> the shepherds, most likely, were able to follow it to the stable. But now they're not living in the stable anymore, thank God. They upgraded, and they're, they're in a dwelling, they're in a house, and yet the star guided the wise men there. Did the star move? Was it a star? <laughs> Either way, they could see it from afar. The point is, it's supernatural. All right? How they knew the significance of the star and its connection with Jesus? Not so sure. But they did. So let's look at the wise men. How many were there? Anybody? How many wise men were there? It is a trick question. We don't know. We don't. And as I studied the, the history of the story of the wise men or the magi, what I found really interesting was, and it'll say in here, I think it's somewhere near the 5th century, a folklore was developed about them, and they were given names, and they were, it was decided what countries each one of them came from. And it, it just kind of expanded and I'm like, it's kind of like St. Nicholas, you know? He was an actual monk who was a very wealthy man, became devout with God, sold everything he had and gave it to the poor, and he became a monk. And over the years, he turned into Santa Claus. And now I know how the reindeer can fly. I hadn't, one of my kids liked those, you know, Christmas cartoons that I grew up on, you know, Rudolph and, you know, all the, so I, I hadn't watched him like, 20 some years. So I'm sitting there with Nikki. Nikki just insisted on watching this one. 
And here, I don't even know the name of it. And here's this old wizard in jail. And he's like, well, all I have is my magic corn. I was like, I don't remember this part. Because you know what the magic corn did? It made reindeer fly. So it's like, well, I'm thank you that, you know, now I know that. And I'm, you know, I understand, you know, Santa Claus now. Why he moved from uh, Europe to the North Pole, I have no idea. But see, it, it started with an actual person. A monk who was devout unto God, and, and somehow he grew a beard, got fat, got a red suit, a sleigh, moved to the North Pole, and he has a huge manufacturing uh, plant up there, just recently bought up by Amazon. But anyway, back to the wise men. Who were they? How many were there? We don't know. Over time, the sen- consensus became that there was three, and it's actually thought that the reason that people decided there were three was because there were three gifts, right? But there could have been tons of wise men. We need to pray there's more than three wise men in the world today. Anyway, who were they and where did they come from? Again, we're not completely sure, but tradition suggests that they were men of high position from Parthia. I didn't know this. Anybody, how many of you knew this, that they think they were from Parthia? Yeah, there you go piece of information. Worthless, but hey, it's here. Parthia was near the site of ancient Babylon. The reason they knew this star could mean the Messiah is they speculate they could have been Jews who remained in Babylon after the exile. Now, just like a lot of Hebrews, Jews, Israelites chose, at least two tribes, chose to, they'd go over and fight in the promised land, but they chose to stay in the wilderness which blows my mind, but they did. A lot of people who, Israelites that were carried away into Babylon, a lot of them chose to stay there. They became comfortable, you know, under their oppressors. And, and it, it's kind of like the whole idea of a bondservant. In the New Testament, a bondservant couldn't pay their bills, so they sold themselves as slaves to the person they owed money to, and it would typically be for a seven-year period of time, and at seven years, the debt would be paid, but if they, their life under that master was gr- better than their life on their own, they would choose to be a bondservant. So they would choose to be a slave to that person for the rest of their life. They'd take an all, punch a hole in their ear, and put a great big gold ring in it. And we've had big gold rings and ears ever since. But anyway, these, the speculation is, is they could have been initially Hebrews who were now wise men in other countries. Now, did that happen? Sure, it happened with Daniel. Um, in a sense, it happened with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It ab- absolutely happened with who else? Joseph, second to the Pharaoh. So that's a possibility, but all this is speculation. There, there isn't anything that they feel is validated proof of who they are. It was about the eighth century that the names of these three magi appeared. Magically. Uh, Bithesaria, uh, um, Melachoir, that's just how I would pronounce it, and Gathaspa appeared in a chronicle known as the uh, Experta Latina Barbia. They had become known most commonly as Belshazzar. <laughs> this is what's so funny. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> They're mixing up Daniel and all... But somehow, this came about. They were actually given names. We don't even know if there were three. Now they're named, and there's probably a shrine to them somewhere. But they were magi in the Greek. Well, what does magi mean? Well, it simply translates in English as magic. But what it truly meant in their day, there were wise men who who from all over the the east at that time, from a region that is now Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and other areas like southern Turkey, northern Syria, where these magi were assigned to the rulers of these regions. And they were most predominantly known as astrologists. Now, it's not like you open, they weren't, they didn't write the horoscope for the newspaper, Okay. That's not what they did. Back then, an astro- astronomy and astrology was really kind of together. 
their job was to study the stars and the patterns of the stars, but they also developed kind of a folklore out of it, which I think is the foundation of what we have now. But these wise men, that's what they were paid to do, and they were to serve their leader with the information that they had. So somewhere in the East, these magi came to the conclusion together that that star was leading them to the king of the Jews. They couldn't get on a bus or a plane or a train. So they, they had a camel caravan. Uh, one of the young people who was in my youth group when I was in South Dakota is now a music pastor in uh, western North Dakota, and he sent me a picture of their Christmas performance. And they had laid down this big, long rubber mat because they didn't have a camel, but they strapped two pillows on a horse. And he just said, he says, this is, you know, a low-budget Christmas production. But, yeah, they traveled by camel. I don't know how many, you know, miles per hour, probably meters per hour, a camel gets. But we know that it took them quite some time. So, first of all, they saw the star. They had to come to agreement. If they were coming from different countries, all I know is they saw it. They had to figure out what it is. They had to go to their king. They had to get permission to go. Most likely, they had to get permission from their wife. Um, they had to pack up. They had to decide what to bring. And they made this trip to see Jesus as a toddler. So they were given... They could have been priests from ancient Persia um, because Magi actually um, specifically came from ancient Persia in a religion, a religion that was called Zoroastrianism. So these most likely priests, uh, astronomers, astrologers of another nation, of another religion, left everything to go honor Jesus. That, to me, is the most significant part of these magi, these king. And the reason it's significant is because if they do, how much more should we? It's interesting, they describe each one of them by the 8th century according to even their, their physical characteristics. That Gaspar, one of the three, had brown hair, brown eyes, no beard, <laughs> wore a green cloak and a gold crown with green jewels on it, and he is the king of Sheba, and he brought the frankincense. And Melchor, he had long white hair and a white beard and wears a gold cloak and he was the king of Arabia. Um, and Melchor represented the gold, and he brought to Jesus. And Balthazar, well, he had black skin and a black beard, or no beard, and wears a purple cloth, and he is the king of Tarsus, or Mes uh, Macedonia in Egypt. And he brought the myrrh. Again, none of this showed up until the 8th century. Where it came from, I don't know. But if you look at the manger scene, you look at the nativity, you see that they're dressed in those colors. So maybe somebody copyrighted it in the uh, 8th century so they could sell the only authentic nativity scene. Herod is another character in the significance of this story. And there is, a, like I said, a transition of power. Now, the reason Herod catches my attention here is because Herod the Great, he was... He, uh, he was the chief of the narcissists, okay? And he was maniacal in how he would destroy other leaders when he took over their land. Um, you know, it, it, back then it was like they had to make a statement. And one of their typical statements was they would cut the head off of all the people in charge and stick them on a pole outside of the city. And, and they would leave them there for a long time. And it's like, those were your leaders. But more than that, Herod knew enough that he would do everything to strip the culture, all right? And, and they, they would take away musical instruments. They would force them to learn different styles of music, theirs. They would try to force them 
to teach their children their language and not their original language. They do everything to strip the culture away. And Herod was this way, but because Herod was so ruthless, he also was known for being extremely paranoid. He was just paranoid that somebody was going to pay him back, that some other country, some other leader was going, it's going to catch up with him. And one of the things that Herod did when I was in Israel, one of the places that I learned about, went to, walked up, climbed up, walked through, was the Herodian. And how many are familiar with the Herodian? Okay, there's a few. And when Herod the Great came, one of the things he did to oppress the people was he took all Hebrew men from 12 years old and older, and he made them work 12 to 14-hour days building this huge mountain called Herodian. It was a fortress. It was going to be the high point. It was where, and on top, he made several palaces. It was like, you know, <laughs> there it is. It was like Trump Tower. Um, but it, it was this huge fortress, and inside that, now, you got to realize that was all level ground. And he made the Hebrews, his slaves now, bring every rock upon rock, every bag of dirt, and build that thing. And inside, there are two reservoirs, which together, they hold 3.1 million gallons of water. And that was his fortress. This is a paranoid king. And he's going to build himself his own fortresses and, and, and get, you know, for protection. This is the man who, when the, the wise men came to and said, the king of the Jews is born in Bethlehem. He's like, oh, really? Well, come and tell me so I can worship him. There's no way. His paranoia, that's why he killed from two years old on all the Hebrew boys. There, there was just, that's just where he was at, especially at the end of his reign, was just extremely paranoid. Well, what's interesting is, and we know the story, that when all the census happens, he decrees that. Not too long after that, Herod dies. And his son, um, Archelaus, then is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, 13 through 23. He became the ruler, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him that they could come back from Egypt. But because he was the son of Herod, they didn't want to go back to the Bethlehem area, and so they ended up in Nazareth. So we have all these different key figures. I mean, Herod is, he is in all of the Greek and Roman history. He's, he, you know, all of the history that happened in biblical time outside of the Bible mentions many of these key characters. And for the sake of time, I, I, I will mention them, but... Um, even Caesar Augustus, who was Octavian, was the Roman emperor during this time. Um, he was, you know, he was over Herod. In fact, he was a part of actually split, splitting his kingdom. He moved the leadership of Rome from the Senate, all right, to just him being in power, and then he put these people in power over regions. So all of this is written in the history of other nations and other people groups. And in it, you'll find the story of Jesus. So here are all these key figures. Why? Because God wanted the whole world to know that he sent his son, Jesus. All right? Just like he wanted the whole world to know that he led his people out of captivity from Egypt. And the last thing I want to hit quick in this story are the gifts. Gold was always the gift given to royalty. And so the gold represented that they were acknowledge him as the king that he would be. Frankincense was a gift of deity, right? And it was, it was a, a, an acknowledgement that he was a priest. Uh, quick advertisement. <laughs> he was the high priest. And guys, I, it, there's been several of you that have wanted us to just have a Bible study. Wednesday night is going to be the Bible study on the book of Hebrews. The first nine and a half chapters are really about who Jesus is, what he fulfilled, what he brought completion to, what he represents. And one of them is he is the high priest. Now, the Magi knew it, and that's what that gift represented. Um, we are still, by the way, having the Monday night class, which is an incredible accountability and support group for men. Um, 
and I, I've had some guys over the week, the holiday want to be added to that group as well. But back to the story. The third one is myrrh. And myrrh is that spice used to anoint bodies. And specifically, do you know what myrrh was important for? It kept the body from stinking. Okay? So it, 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 it was, that was its specific. So why is this important to Jesus? Why are these three? Because I've heard people say, you know, it was prophet, priest, and king. Well, it's certainly that he was king, and it was certainly that he was the priest, but myrrh was more as significant that he was going to die. So to Christians, gold is associated with Jesus being the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Frankincense, the fact that he became the high priest. But myrrh was the perfume that would be put on his body because he came to die for our sins. That is a whole lot to pack into one story of a birth of a baby. But it's all there to point to Jesus for who he really is. Just like the star did. Just, you know, in its significance of the star, that it actually drew, uh, you know, priests and astrologists from other countries to come and acknowledge that this supernatural phenomenon of, of the sky was confirming that this is a king from God. This is the Messiah. This is the king of Jews. History was built around the coming of this king. Time was measured differently before him than after him. So the question is, is your life also built around him? We're coming into a new year, and one of the things we trust to see, hopefully, in this next year, is the end of this horrible pandemic. Now, there's some signs in this latest derivation that it could be in the next six months we move from a t pandemic into an epidemic. It kind of like the flu. I hope, but my hope isn't in science. My hope isn't in medicine. My hope is in God. And I pray for the end of it, but I know this, we're going into a new year, a new season, a new epoch. And as we transition, how much of it has to do with the fact that our real king, our real leader, our real authority's name is Jesus? I wake up every day and I pray to Jesus. I long since stopped turning on Fauci, okay? But I think there's a lot of people in America today kind of praying to Fauci. What does Fauci have to say about my life today? What does Jesus have to say about your life today? I don't say, I would not, let me quote the words of Paul, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Okay? Be smart about how you respond to this. But ultimately, are you acknowledging Jesus in, the, in your life? Is he the centerpiece of your life? And I would challenge you, we have a few days before the transition. God has a transition for you. I mean, I'm watching this whole next epoch, this season of Christianity unfold before my eyes. I remember several years ago, some of the key global evangelists who are in their 80s, and they came together and they decided that they were going to pray to see what? Anyone? One billion souls saved. And when I heard that, I was like, ah, that's an awful lot of people. How many people did Reinhard Bonnke lead to the Lord in Africa? Anybody? It's, if, if I remember right, it was 50, like 57 million. But do you realize that there's been Several hundred million come to the Lord just this year. It's over 400 million that they've been able to track. Um, and that's outside the United States, people. <laughs> in fact, that's mostly in the Eastern Hemisphere. And so you start thinking about that. In one year, 400 million. All of a sudden, that billion mark becomes that much more feasible. What I saw in the one opportunity I had. And, and it might, I don't know how much more will happen. I'm open to it. I'm in negotiations right now. I think there has to be negotiations because what they want is they want me on four times a day. And I'm like, 
No. <laughs> four, uh, four 47 minute segments because they now have a second satellite television station. But what an opportunity. And they said, you realize 60% of your audience is always Muslim. And it's like, who would have ever thought? I mean, when I was in Bible college, the missionary we had come in that was from Persia, which was uh, Iran, had one convert in 27 years. And it was like, this is how it is. Guess how it is right now? <laughs> Over 200 million from Muslim countries have turned to Christ. Now, what's made the change? Well, Jesus. I mean, ultimately, this is the season we're coming into. How is that affecting your life? Is he the center of your life, or has he become this eh, obscure piece of history? Is Jesus the center of your life? If he's not, you can't live the life of an overcomer or walk in the peace or the victory that he gave you by dying for you. Now, all these millions are getting saved overseas, but what I, in my Christmas season, have been running into here is people who I've known in the Christian community for years who've walked into my life just recently, many of them, lost, confused, disenchanted with life, but ultimately coming to the reality that they're not going to have peace again until Jesus is back where he belongs in the center. So stand with me as we conclude this service. I just want to challenge you with that. Is Jesus the center of your life? Man, we can get to the point where we come to church and it's, it's a habit, it's a routine, we feel better when we do. But that's not what Jesus died for. He died to be the center of our life that we walk with him every day. I would encourage you to begin this year in prayer and, and develop a new plan, his plan for your life. With the help of the Holy Spirit, make a list of the top eternal priorities that you have. Not, not the top financial priorities. There was a huge, huge multi-level marketing campaign and it would always, you knew you were being coffee shopped when they would ask, what's the highest priority in your life? And it was a Christian company. And I always, always, always answer, Jesus. And they go, oh, that's great. But no, 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 no. What's the highest financial priority in your life? And that's when I knew who they were. And we had a special name for them. But Jesus needs to be the highest priority in your life. So I would encourage you to take that time, right? Without such a list of your top eternal priorities, you can become so overwhelmed with things like the pandemic, the political climate, the cares of this life, that they can dictate and steer your life. When God has a destiny for you, you need to reset your compass to Jesus. The wise men saw a supernatural sign and that drastically changed the course of their lives. To honor a king that wasn't even their own, Jesus is your king. And it's time for us to honor him and to let him redirect our life. Steer your life back to him. There's a word for that. It's called repentance. Let him change your direction, your heart, your mind, your attitude. He has the plan for your life to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. We're going to leave the altars open. Um, we don't have a watch night service. Um, and I would encourage you that you would start praying in the new year right now. And whether it's at your seat or at this altar, I'm just going to give a general benediction and then we're going to sing surrounded. I want to encourage you to take some time and just commit to Jesus that he'll be the center of this new year, of your new journey, of your next season, and ask him to direct your steps again. God, I thank you, Lord, that you, you had a plan for our life before this world even began. You chose us. In fact, you, we are considered your, your masterpieces that you designed before you even designed the earth for us. God, Jesus was at the center of that design. He's the tree of life. 
when Adam and Eve in their sin couldn't even go partake of that fruit anymore, but then you sent that tree <laughs> to Bethlehem to die on the cross so we could partake. So Lord, may we come to you, come to that tree of life and get direction and hope and joy and peace again. So this new year is embraced in excitement and anticipation, not in depression and frustration. So God, just call us, draw us to you, and may we respond. We we'll pick up the phone when you call and listen in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to come as we sing. If not, bless you and have a happy new year. Altar workers, if you want to come forward for anyone that wants prayer. There's a table you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battle There's a table you prepare for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles And I believe This is how I fight my battles. And this is how I fight my battles. And this is how. And this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is Praise and thanksgiving.